This video is brought to you by Scentbird. Demons, horned evil creatures, the smell of sulfur, red skin associated with hellfire, 666. These are all the things that would normally come to our head if we were asked to imagine a demon. Whether you be an atheist or a theist, you associate all of these things with the mental representation and processing of the word. But where do these characteristics come from? And are there any references in the Hebrew Biblical script to justify them? Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and this is another episode of my series about the literal translation and interpretation of the Bible. This series will help you distinguish which information derives directly from a literal translation of the biblical text conveyed by its grammatical construction and historical context, and which ones are instead allegorical interpretations, medieval theology, within Western thought. In other words, the Truth Series Explained is a linguistic discussion trying to give you a translator's perspective onto the information contained in period sources. Through textual analysis, grounding our observation on social, cultural and artistic devices used by the original authors, without the theological and cultural layers that, as we can see, have clearly become entrenched in our minds. If you wish to believe the theology and add it yourself to my work, be my guest on the same note, theists, atheists or agnostics, you're all welcome here. Moreover, our discussion today is not ontological. We are not talking about whether these things exist, but how they were believed or perceived by both the ancient Israelites and subsequently by medieval Europeans in period. Whenever we read a passage from an ancient text, we also need to consider the reasons behind a specific word choice. What was the target audience? How is such word used within a poetic frame? And we also need to be aware of our own cultural and linguistic preconception, namely the expectations and the semantic baggage that comes with a translated word whenever we select a viable candidate in translation. In other words, translation is a cognitive theory, and any translated work is but one within many possible and results. And the words in the receiving languages we choose are of an associative nature within our processes in memory. We do it without even realizing it, which is why it is my opinion that literal interpretation requires a metacognitive process. Differently from the angels which are constantly spoken about, the Old Testament doesn't give a lot of space to demonic entities, as these presents are most often mentioned rather than explained. This, of course, presents a challenge, and empirically, it becomes even more problematic when we try to attribute the modern Western definition of the word demon onto the ancient text. Still, some specific names are mentioned, and various types seem to be indicated. And there are even some apparently innocent words that may retain a hidden, or should I say veiled, meaning when looking at them in the original language, such as the word goat, particularly through the lenses of textual parallelism. The Old Testament doesn't tell us much about what the ancient Israelites believed when it comes to evil spirits, or how they interface with the human realm, so we might need to look at a few surrounding cultures and beliefs as well to paint a more complete picture. We know that some Israelites sacrificed such beings, and perhaps some images, actual physical images, were involved. But a slightly more precise idea of what such beings may look like can be found in ancient Sumerian belief systems. For instance, late Babylonian imagery connects the idea of humans with goat faces. Egyptians also represent some malevolent spirits in half-human, half-animal form. Mesopotamians associated evil spirits with very specific illnesses and personal misfortune. Now, the New Testament, which was written in Greek, we'll get back to that in a second, does report that Jesus himself performed several exorcisms to expel demons. Consequently, our question here today is the following. Can the English idea of the word demon, the way we understand it today, carry over into the Old Testament ideas of Bronze Age Israel? Now, don't get me wrong, sulfur does have a really bad smell, but you know what doesn't have a really bad smell? The kind sponsor that made this video possible, Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service where you can join a vibrant community that is very passionate for scent and values it as a form of expression. Now, summer is a great time to do fun stuff like finding a new summer scent to wear. And the great thing about Scentbird is that you don't have to buy a full-sized bottle to experiment with it, since as you sign in, you'll receive up to three travel-sized scents monthly, so you can switch around. 
So in this case, we have got three different ones, Side Effect, Sexual Noir, and Agua de Santos. Now, when you choose a fragrance, you can choose between a designer or a niche fragrance for only $17 a month. Now, personally, I like experimenting with niche brands more, like Confession of a Rebel, Parfum de Marly, DS and Durga. But if you are into the big names, then they also offer Prada, Gucci, Dolce, and many more. Now, I discovered this one in particular, and my wife really likes it. Agua de Santos. And it's always nice to get compliments like that. I'd like to show you how the case opens. It's very simple, that's how you open it. And this is how you can either lock it or unlock it so that you can begin to spray. Click the link in the description and use my code METATRON for a 55% off at Scentbird. It's just a little over $7 for your first month. Available in the USA and Canada. And as always, big thanks to Scentbird for sponsoring my channel. What is the linguistic connection of the modern English word demon with whatever word was used in the original text? Keep in mind that there isn't one single word in Biblical Hebrew that would translate perfectly the Christian concept attached to the modern English word demon. So when in English you find words like demon, evil spirit or devils, the counterpart in Hebrew has an array of different words, which are not synonymous with each other and present some significant differences. We therefore will see how concepts are combined to generate novelty, aka conceptual combination. However, if we dig deeper, there is some common ground with both Western thought and Western languages at an etymological level. Let's have a look at ancient Greek. The English word demon in origin is Greek, daimon, from the root da, to divide. So let's see how the Greeks understood it in its original meaning since this word went through its own semantic evolution through time. Even though it is attested mainly as a philosophical divine or spiritual entity, often but not always with a negative sense, its earlier meaning should be semantically related to its root, giving us ruler who divides. The original Greek word just means a spirit in ancient Greek. It doesn't have to be negative, but it can be. Here is an example of a positive meaning. For example, a person in high spirit or living in a euthymic state, if you will. But there are other possible translations of the word, which can be connected with a biblical text. Deity, divine power, lesser god, guiding spirit, tutelary deity, sometimes including souls of the dead. Now here comes the linguistic dilemma. Is it possible to reconcile this original meaning in the ancient Greek etymology to the words used in the biblical text in biblical Hebrew? Both with the idea of neutrality, sometimes evil, and even deity. Let's jump into the text and let's see if we can find a tether. Biblically speaking, several of the entities which we find translated just as demons in English are in fact originally those deities that were worshipped by the enemy of Israel. It's a relative perspective, woven within the threads of ancient tribalistic defense mentality. Us versus them, inward versus outward. We can thus demonstrate that both the Greek word and the ancient Hebrew word are both interleaved at a semantic level. Beelzebub, the Lord of Flies, a name of a high-ranking demon. The name of this demon derives from the biblical name Baal Zebub, in his capacity as the god of the hated Philistines, specifically the god of the city of Ekron. So in the Bible, Beelzebub or Baal Zebub isn't a demon per se, he is the deity worshipped by the enemy. In time, he became the representative of the heathen power and consequently the arch enemy. So it becomes the name of a demon in the modern understanding. But to the ancients, he would have been an enemy deity or a false idol or incorrect worship, however you want to put it. You see, in ancient religions, Baal Zebub was associated with several sacrifices in connection with his ability to cast away flies, hence the name. Plagues often being associated with the presence of flies. So sacrifices were made, blood was shed so that he would use his power to cast away the flies, removing diseases. What makes this name relevant is because it's mentioned by Jesus himself in Matthew. Let's have a look. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Whereupon Jesus answered, if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Please keep in mind that the word demon in this case, the one used by Yeshua, Jesus, should be understood as the word Shedim, 
We'll talk about what this means and how this connects with the idea of worship of other deities later on in the video. Just keep it in mind. Baal. Baal was an honorific title, meaning owner, lord, in the Northwest Semitic languages spoken in the Levant during antiquity. From its usage among people, it was associated with the worship or naming or titles of gods. Once again, it should be understood more as a title rather than a proper noun or given name. Now, there are several entities in the biblical text that are described as Baal something, and oftentimes within theology, these all become demons. But from the strict biblical reading, these are more adversaries of the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. Now, what's interesting is that not only do we hear their names with their titles, so Baal, Pehor, but also their epithet, in this case, Kemosh. Once again, originally a deity worshipped by the Moabites, which we could consider to be the Lord of Exposure, in the sexual sense. So, with ceremonies of an obscene sexual nature. And we do have biblical accounts of Israelites that are sort of converted, so to speak, or maybe we should say tempted into such a carnal ritual, and then when they go back, they get annihilated for it. Wilt not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So having seen this, perhaps there is more within the etymological connection from the choice of a specific word in Greek, which also had an under meaning of a deity, and the way these entities, which we'd normally imagine as demons, originally were in fact deities. But then with time, in Greek, Baal Pehor becomes Bel Fagor, a demon. A direct military adversary becomes a demon. Lilith is fundamentally absent in the Bible, exception being one verse, and perhaps we could say two. But we need to dig for the second one. Most likely the concept of Lilith, or Lilith, was born in Babylonia 4,000 years ago, and it is possible that its origins have in fact a connection to the even older sumero akkadic world. She's mentioned and appears in Gilgamesh and is described as being extremely dangerous, particularly for pregnant women and their children. Now, there are several possible images that might be iconographic representations of what Lilith was supposed to look like, one of which would be representing her as a beautiful naked woman with wings and claws. Now, this representation also adds horns. It is, however, a bit debated still. We're not 100% sure that this is Lilith. But my take is that it probably is. Originally, we are told that she lives in the desert, but as her figure goes through several different cultures and civilizations, her name is just more broadly associated with the wilderness. Now, in the Bible, Lilith is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, but it's a little hidden. From a cultural understanding, she's absolutely connected to nocturnal animals, such as the owl. But depending on what version you read, sometimes she's described just as an owl, other times she's just mentioned as the witch of the night. Regardless of what you find, the original word in Hebrew is Lilith. No doubts about it. She's in there, even when not present in the translated form. Another name that is given to Lilith within the publication of the Jewish society is the monster of the night. So what's the etymology of this name? Well, this is really difficult because, of course, it's an extremely ancient word. But it has been speculated that the word Lilith has a connection with the Hebrew word Lila, which means night. That's possible. We can't really pinpoint it 100%. Now, in the Talmud, we are presented with even more information when it comes to Lilith and what she looks like. We are told that she has very long hair and she is extremely connected with the sexual act in the sense that one of the things that Lilith does is to go around at night looking for men who are sleeping alone, so that she may have sex with them and have kids. Now, what do I mean when I say that Lilith, perhaps, has been mentioned in fact twice in the Bible, but the first time that she was mentioned was in fact veiled? Well, have you ever heard of this idea that Lilith was in fact the first woman, in the sense that first you have Adam and Lilith, but then Adam rejects Lilith, she leaves, and then Eve is created. Well, if you have heard this, then keep in mind that this comes from medieval theology and interpretation. But what do they base it on? This is going to be interesting. Check this out. 
This has to do with the Genesis account of the creation of man and woman. And normally, if you recall it, whenever we think about the creation of Eve as the first woman, we look at Genesis 2, 22, when we say, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. But from the fact that in the original language it doesn't say rib, but I'll have to make a dedicated video on Adam and Eve. So for now, let's just run with it. But usually this is when, biblically speaking, Eve is created. But if we go back one chapter, in Genesis 1 verse 27, we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So medieval theology, as they were discussing these verses, noticed that before the creation of Eve, it appears that another female was created at the same time as Adam was. So this would be the so-called hidden mention of Lilith. It is a speculation, but it is an interesting one. The origin of number 666 as in connection with the devil has to do with the book of Revelation, where it is described as the number of the beast. As it reads, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the numbers of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. So apart from being a number connected with evil, what does it mean? So the idea is number of a man or beast may refer to the practice of the so-called gematria, which is a Kabbalistic method of interpreting the Hebrew scriptures by computing the numerical value of words based on those of their constituent letters. In other words, in Jewish numerology, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet corresponds to a number. Aleph is one, Bet is two, etc. And words and names can correspond to the sum of these numbers. So using gematria, scholars have variously decoded 666 to become a name. The leading theory would be that it would decipher into these letters, which can be read as Nero Caesar. So the Roman Emperor Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. Something that can be added to this is the fact that initially the most ancient number in connection with evil, which would predate the one in Revelation, would actually be 616, which would correspond with two emperors prior, Caligula. Because remember we have Caligula, Claudius, and then Nero. Now this of course could connect in the mind of early Christians with the idea of Nero's persecutions, but because it is a very deep topic and there are people that reject the idea or the historicity of the persecutions of Christians at the hands of Nero, that once again will need its dedicated video. As for now, I'm just presenting the information here. Now, when it comes to Satan, theologically, it would require its own video, if not series. But when it comes to the biblical, literal translation and the usage of the word in Hebrew scripture, the first thing I'd like to mention is the fact that Satan, Satan, is actually a job in the sense that it's a, an office. It's something you do. And it translates as adversary. Although sometimes it's interesting to look at it from a different point of view, in the sense that it could also be intended, linguistically speaking, as prosecutor, at least in the Old Testament. And as we will explore briefly medieval theology on the concept of demons, we'll see that his name, of course, comes again as one of the princes of hell. The dragon in Revelation, the serpent in Genesis, Lucifer himself as the fallen star, theologically are all connected to Satan. But it is theology that makes that connection, as linguistically, the book doesn't do that for you. When it comes to demons and medieval thought, if I had to choose two words to describe the situation in the medieval period, I would choose the words variety and hybridity. That is because, first of all, medieval theologians were absolutely obsessed with demons, in the sense that you can find so much written about demons, so much so that I have to just keep it relatively simple here and kind of touch upon a few aspects. But the reason why I would choose the word hybridity is because of contemporary representation in visual media in period. When it comes to the nature and physicality of demons as described by medieval theology, we can see a massive difference with the iconographic representation and the written word. Say, for example, the De Doctrina Cristiana or De Civitate Dei. Medieval authors, artists and theologians also went through the Greco-Roman world, taking the spirits, the monsters, even the neutral entities, and they are transformed into demons. It is a way to address paganism through the lenses of medieval Christianity. 
And in the 12th century we have a massive increase when it comes to the visual representation of demonic forces. We have both terrifying and awe-inspiring imagery, deceptive beauty and bestial horror. Look at, for example, the 12th century Sententiarium Libri Quator. Manuscripts, illuminations, together with medieval church architectural art, all of these represent demons in a hybrid form. Even though medieval period theological works usually understood demons as having the same physical attributes as angels. Hence, the stark difference. There is even an approach which has to do with levels of purity in the air, since according to the medieval idea, angels are incorporeal and are made of a thinner, purer air, whereas demons, meaning angels that fall, are differently made when it comes to the substance of the quality or thickness, should we say, of the inferior air that made them. So it's a very different approach. It is within medieval thought that we find the unusual colouring of the skin, a more physical representation, bat-like wings, enlarged limbs and teeth, horns. Now when it comes to the seven princes of hell, we once again have loads of different possible approaches. Who are the seven princes of hell? And are we sure that there are seven? There are lots of different lists with different names or sometimes the same names associated with different sins. But the idea of the medieval thought was to try and classify. They were trying to create a classification system to try and give order within the realm of the forces of evil. And vices such as greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, sloth, all of these get a specific demonic prince associated to them. And depending on what scale, the number can be six, the number can be nine to match the nine orders or circles of hell. It is interesting that, for example, in the scale of Novenary, Belzebub, which we talked about in the first part of this video, is associated with false gods. So we find our association with both the Greek etymology of the word that we talked about and the original meaning in the Bible. In Binfield classification, both Lucifer and Satan are separate, one connected to pride, one connected to wrath. When it comes to demonic typologies, biblically speaking, we have mostly three types. The Seirim, which are the so-called hairy beings, usually associated with goats, which are satyr, like demons, described as dancing in the wilderness, very similar to the jinn of the Arabian woods and deserts. We have the Shedim, often one of the words that we find just simply translated as demons, but Shedim were not necessarily evil spirits, like the ones that cause maladies. Shedim are in fact gods of the foreigners, which could be considered evil because they were enemies. Depending on which tradition you look at, sometimes they're said to have hybrid looks and can shapeshift. We then have the aluka. It is a feminine Hebrew word which in the Bible you find translated simply as leech or horse leech. Now this is a specific type of blood lusting monster. In a way, it's the ancient Hebrew version of a vampire. They are found in Proverbs 30, for example, in the Bible, verse 15, if you want to double check it. Now when I said that there are mainly three typology in the original text, those of you who are familiar with rabbinical demonology might disagree, and I absolutely understand that. That is because within rabbinical demonology, I could begin a list and finish it tomorrow. Harmers, evil spirits, night spirits, shade or evening spirits, midday spirits, morning spirits, demons that bring famine, storm demons. But all of this is built upon the original text rather than being necessarily explained within it, which is why I'm only mentioning it on passing but not diving into it. Similarly to how I'm just mentioning on passing medieval theology when it comes to demons rather than diving into it. Within the medieval thought, we start seeing stuff like obsessions, possessions, fairies, spectra, in other words, spirit to trouble houses or solitary places, incubi and succubi, the sexual harassing demons, if you will, druids, familiars, imp-like creatures. The list becomes extremely deep, but a lot of these are connected to previous and pre-existing pagan creatures which are adapted within the spectrum of the Christian theological understanding of the Bible. Last but not least, I would like to discuss the concept of smell associated to demons. It appears that there is no explicit reference in the Bible to point to anything that suggests that demons may have a smell. There are some mentions of the importance of order, for example, in Ephesians 5.2, Philippians 4.18, an order of a sweet smell, which is a sacrifice acceptable to God. In Ephesians, Paul tells us that the demons are princes of the power of the air. So when they are not located in hell, 
there in the air. But probably the only connection that we may find outside of what some exorcists have said is Revelation 19.20, where we read that the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That is the only connection between sulfur and the underrealm. In Tobit, however, we do read something that maybe could be a pointer. He remembered the words of Raphael, and he took the live ashes of incense and put the heart and liver of the fish upon them and made a smoke. And when the demon smelled the odor, he fled to the remotest parts of Egypt, and the angel bound him. So, if anything, odor from a scriptural basis would be inviting to God and off-putting to the demons. Now, the idea that something that had an original meaning becomes a demon, so there is a change, shouldn't really surprise us. In fact, it happens a lot. Let's have a look at this passage in Revelation. We have the war in heaven between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels, which are then cast down to earth, and once again, these angels become demons. We therefore see that sometimes the word demon should probably be better translated as adversary. Moreover, the line between what an angel is and what a demon is can be significantly blurry, biblically speaking. Let's have a look at Revelation 9.11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. Now, there is quite a bit of debate within theology, which again is kind of outside of my sphere, when it comes to whether this Apollyon mentioned in Revelation is a demon or an angel. I don't have theological answers to present, but I think what's interesting is the fact that it is in fact a little blurry, oftentimes, when we just look at the original texts. And parallelism can help us respond to that. For instance, the angel of the Lord who smote all the firstborns of Egypt was likewise called Abaddon, in the sense of destroyer. This Hebrew term for destroyer derives from the verb shahat, to destroy. So if the one in the Old Testament which has the same name we call an angel, then why is this one a demon even though he has the same name? In this case, the only common ground is the modus operandi. So the situation appears deeper than we thought. Translating some of these entities, particularly the named ones with the English term demon is, from a translation point of view, a superimposition. You can believe that they are false gods or demons if that's what your religion preaches, but that's an interpretation. You should be made aware that these aren't in fact called demons in the text in the Western sense. All right, noble ones, but if you find this video interesting, please let me know. There is still a lot to say, but this is as much as I could put into one concise and compact video. But if you want me to talk more about these things, let me know, share this video, and as always, don't forget to check out the link in the description to take advantage of the amazing offer by Scentbird. Thank you very much for watching, and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye.